From time to time, as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints releases a new volume of the Joseph Smith Papers, we have the opportunity to look at that volume and discuss some of the history contained therein. Each of these volumes more fully develops our history and the life and mission of Joseph Smith the prophet. This new one, Documents Volume 7, covers that little known period between war and expulsion in Missouri and life in beautiful Nauvoo. When we're looking at Latter-day Saint history, sometimes we tend to jump from the Saints' expulsion from Missouri in 1839, and then suddenly we go to 1841 in Nauvoo where the city government's in place and the Nauvoo Legion's in place and the University of Nauvoo is, is being built up. And we kind of skip over the uh, roughly year and a half that the Saints have um, when they move to the commerce area, what would become Nauvoo, and when the actual city government is set up. And that's what Document 7 covers. It's a book that contains numerous documents detailing this very early period of the establishment of Nauvoo. So it's a very important book because it shows us the struggles that the saints had in trying to establish this community in a swampy area, uh, the troubles that they had with disease, uh, the issues that they had with trying to get enough land so that those saints coming to the area uh, could have parcels of land, could build houses, could gather there, uh, because Nauvoo was supposed to be a gathering uh, area for the saints, just as Missouri had been before it. When the Mormons first purchased land in what would become Nauvoo, they actually acquired a lot more property on the western side of the Mississippi River than on the east. We, we recognize what Nauvoo became, the city in metropolitan center that it became the new gathering place for the church. And sometimes it's easy to forget that the initial idea, in fact, for the first few years after the saints had arrived in the area, was to set up a kind of twin city ar uh, arrangement with Nauvoo on the east side of the Mississippi and Zarahemla was to be named a city on the west side. But when the church first purchased land, they purchased um, somewhere between six and 700 acres in the Hancock County area. But across the river, approximately 30 times that amount of land, uh, close to 20,000 acres of land in Iowa. So the idea was that they would settle in both, in both areas. Now they bought this land from a variety of different landholders. For anyone who has been to Nauvoo today, it's a beautiful location. Uh, it's a very small, quiet city during most of the year. Of course, that booms during the uh, tourist season, during the summer, or times of the Nauvoo pageant and that kind of thing. But by and large, it's just a beautiful area. Manicured lawns, uh, very few trees, wide open spaces, uh, black topped roads. And it's kind of hard to even imagine to set aside that kind of almost pastoral view that we would have there today, to set that aside and consider what the area would have looked like when the saints arrived. The place was literally a wilderness. The land was mostly covered with trees and bushes and much of it so wet that it was with the utmost difficulty that a footman could get through and totally impassable for teams. Believing that it might become a healthy place by the blessing of heaven to the saints and no more eligible place presenting itself, I considered it wisdom to make an attempt to build a city. Joseph Smith. In this instance, Joseph called commerce a wilderness. Others would hear him describe it as a low, marshy, wet, damp, and nasty place. One of the documents in Documents Volume 7 is a letter written by Joseph Smith to a land speculator named Horace Hotchkiss. I presume you are no stranger to the part of the city plat we bought of you, it being a deathly, sickly hole, and that we have not been able in consequence to realize any valuable consideration from it, although we have been keeping up appearances and holding out inducements to encourage immigration that we scarcely think justifiable in consequence of the mortality that almost invariably awaits those who come from far distant places. 
And yet Joseph had a vision for Nauvoo that is very apparent when he gets there. He sees Nauvoo as rising above the swampy land and as becoming a great city. And that vision we see uh, in Documents Volume 7. And we also see all that Joseph tried to do during these years to make that vision become a reality. It's also very important because as Joseph is trying to build up Nauvoo at this time, you have the specter of the violence in Missouri that continues to hover above the saints. They had just been expelled from Missouri. Joseph had been in Liberty Jail uh, for several months, uh, was finally allowed to escape in April of 1839, and he moves to the Commerce area um, in the summer of 1839. But what happened in Missouri uh, affects Joseph. It affects the saints. It influences what they want Nauvoo to become. As they had been commanded in Revelation, the Latter-day Saints sought redress at the local, state, and national level for the wrongs and injustices they had suffered in Missouri. It was November the 29th, 1839, when Joseph Smith and Elias Higby walked up to the front door of the White House in Washington, D.C. We proceeded to the House of the President. We found a very large and splendid palace surrounded with a splendid enclosure, decorated with all the fineries and elegancies of this world. We went to the door and requested to see the President when we were immediately introduced into an upper apartment where we met the President, Joseph Smith. Now these were the days when you could go to the White House, knock on the door, and be introduced into the president's parlor to meet with him. In fact, Martin Van Buren held almost daily uh, receptions in his parlor that was just outside his uh, second floor office in which men and women could come and talk to him about issues uh, that, that concerned them. They were introduced into the president's parlor. And we know from Lucy Mack Smith's history, the way she tells the story, that there were a number of people vying for the president's attention. And it actually took Joseph Smith and Elias Higby quite a bit of time before they had an audience with the president. And they handed Martin Van Buren the letters of introduction they had received from some prominent political leaders in Illinois and Iowa. And they let him read a description of why they were there and what their purpose was. As soon as he had read one of them, he looked upon us with a kind of half frown and said, what can I do? I can do nothing for you. If I do anything, I shall come in contact with the whole state of Missouri. But we were not to be intimidated and demanded a hearing and constitutional rights. Before we left him, he promised to reconsider what he had said and observe that he felt to sympathize with us on account of our sufferings. Joseph Smith. Ultimately, neither President Martin Van Buren nor the entirety of the United States Congress would do anything to help the Latter-day Saints. The reasons for this, most interesting, are developed in Documents Volume 7. And when the federal government refuses to grant that redress, I think you also see uh, Joseph's love for his fellow saints and how angry that makes him. That he comes out and he condemns Martin Van Buren as a huckstering politician. And so Joseph really, you know, he's, he's, he's very much troubled by uh, the lack of the federal government's aid uh, to the saints. And he's troubled because of his love for the saints and because of how much suffering they had been through. And so I think you kind of see that come through in some of these documents as well. Joseph Smith said that his dog was better fit uh, to be president than Van Buren. Uh, he just really let loose. Uh, on this man, uh, and he never forgave him up until the time that he ran for president in his pamphlet supporting his presidential campaign. He cites the decline of America at the day that Van Buren was inaugurated president. He sees that as the moment of decline in the country's um, progress forward. It was with a keen remembrance of what they had endured in Missouri 
that Joseph Smith and his brethren created the government of Nauvoo. Documents Volume 7 contains a unique and interesting document and the story behind it. It is the Nauvoo Charter. There is no disconnect between the experience uh, in the winter of 1838 and 39 and how the saints uh, intentionally create the city in, of Nauvoo that comes afterwards. So when Joseph um, and the saints decide that Nauvoo will become the new central gathering place when they understand that literally thousands of saints will be arriving there each year and building an, an ever-growing community, one of Joseph's primary concerns is with physically and legally protecting the saints as they come to this area. And you can see those, uh, those concerns incorporated in the language uh, of Nauvoo's charter. We are, we're trying to incorporate a, a, an independent a militia unit body, the Nauvoo Legion. We're trying to establish that we have habeas corpus powers, a municipal court that can hear our own cases arising out of breaches of our own city's ordinances. A city council that can, that can create its own legislation. Each of these elements of an attempt to create a legal structure to protect the saints from past from a repeat of past experience. And it works. The charter passes relatively easily. It's signed into law on December 16th, 1840. And there is more. What, for example, could be the reasons why the Illinois legislature granted such broad and sweeping powers to the city of Nauvoo? It's a telling story. Now, in the Doctrine and Covenants, there are only two revelations that came in Nauvoo, but that in no way means that Joseph Smith was not revealing powerful and new doctrine. I think one of the other remarkable things about Volume 7 is in this volume, we get uh, Joseph Smith's first teachings on what was a new doctrine to the saints in 1840 baptism for the dead. On August 15th, 1840, it's the earliest moment we know of that Joseph introduced the saints um, to baptism for the dead. This is a funeral sermon he's preaching for Seymour Brunson. During the funeral sermon, a widow comes who's recently lost her son, and Joseph tells her that there's a possibility, there's an ordinance that would bring her much joy, um, baptism for the dead. Um, here he only gives a hint. He doesn't try to do a full doctrinal explanation. Later in October at General Conference, he lays out baptism for the dead, gives a doctrinal explanation for it, points to the scriptures, um, and uh, tells the saints that they can perform these ordinances. And this doctrine is just electrifying to the saints. Almost from the point that Joseph Smith first preaches it, the saints are clamoring to be baptized for their dead relatives. These baptisms are performed in the Mississippi River um, at first. And then in January of 1841, Joseph Smith receives a revelation, uh, section 124 in the Doctrine and Covenants, which is also included in Documents Volume 7 that tells him that uh, the ordinance of baptism for the dead needs to be performed in a temple and that the Lord will accept the baptisms in the Mississippi River um, until the baptistry in the Navi Temple is complete. Some of the things we know about early baptism for the dead is that Joseph has instituted a little more strict requirements than we have today about who we could be baptized for. So Joseph tells those early saints they should be baptized for any of their relatives up until their great-grandpa and great-grandma. Um, not to take the line as far back as they can. Um, he also says if any of your acquaintances, um, if you have a revelation that they've received the gospel, you can be baptized on their behalf. Um, the saints are still learning about these things during this period. One of the first baptisms for the dead and perhaps most meaningful to the Smith family was Alvin. On Joseph Smith Sr.'s deathbed, Joseph, and this is according to Mother Smith's history, Joseph goes in to his father and teaches him about baptism for the dead. And Joseph Smith Sr. then, who's going to die September 14th, so he dies the day before the first baptism for the dead, 
He then turns to his son and says, Joseph, make sure you're baptized for Alvin immediately. Um, and we know we have the document where Hiram goes off and is baptized um, for his brother. And who knows, maybe Joseph's the one baptizing them. But, um, an important special moment where Joseph himself is blessed by this ordinance um, soon after it's restored. And I think it's also exciting because we see in this volume the first inclinations of Joseph Smith to build a temple in Nauvoo. Now, whenever the saints had gathered before, whether it was uh, to Kirtland, whether it was to Independence, whether it was to Far West, there had always been plans for a temple to be built. Those plans only came to fruition in Kirtland, uh, where the temple was built and dedicated in 1836. And because of violence and other things in Missouri, the temples planned for Far West and Independence are never built. But within six months, uh, six to nine months of the saints actually settling the commerce area, Joseph is already talking about the necessity of building a temple in Nauvoo, showcasing that Nauvoo was to be a new gathering place for the saints. And speaking of the gathering, for those of us who can trace our origins in the faith to the British Isles, Documents Volume 7 develops a story that is foundational to our personal heritage. I think one other aspect of Documents Volume 7 that's very interesting as well is that it contains correspondence uh, to Joseph Smith and from Joseph Smith to the 12 apostles who are serving their mission in England. Um, so this mission is something that covers uh, the entire time period of this volume. Documents Volume 7 covers September of 1839 through January of 1841. They don't actually leave until August and September of 1839. There's seven of the apostles that depart during that time period. Um, but as they are traveling to England and once they get there, we do have these letters to and from Joseph Smith where the apostles are talking about their mission. They're talking about uh, their impressions of England when they first get there. They talk about how the missionary work is going. We have this very lengthy letter from Heber C. Kimball that is in Documents Volume 7 that is just a treasure, where Kimball outlines in great detail his trip from Nauvoo to England. And then he talks about getting to England and about the social conditions that he's seen, the intense poverty among the people there. And it's just a, a really important letter, I think, um, that highlights how this man, uh, born and raised in the United States, just, you know, and this is his first trip, uh, or not his first trip, it's his second trip to England. He had been there before uh, in 1837 to open the gospel. But it just kind of highlights both his struggles as a missionary, his impressions of this land that he's been called to preach the gospel in, um, and I think it just gives a wonderful flavor to this mission of the 12 apostles to England. Also in this volume, it was September the 14th, 1840, when Joseph Smith Sr., the patriarch to the church, passed away. Not too long after that, a revelation came in which Hiram was called to take that sacred place. This January 1841 revelation uh, tells Hiram Smith that he is now authorized and possesses all of the priesthood and powers and authorities that Oliver Cowdery had. And so he begins to function in kind of that assistant president of the church mode. And I don't think it's um, coincidence that this happens after the death of Joseph Smith Sr. because family was very important to Joseph Smith. Um, and he loved his family greatly. I think he relied on his family a lot. And so this closer tying of Hiram uh, to him coming in the wake of his father's death may have been kind of a tender mercy of the Lord to say, you've lost this beloved figure in your life, but you still have others. You have Hiram, who's been so devoted uh, and so loyal to you, and he will now help you bear the burden of leading the church. And of course, these volumes are the papers of Joseph Smith. He is revealed therein for all the world to see and judge for themselves. And so for me, what really comes out of the documents in this volume is just that this person whose experiences up to this time could very well have led him to throw in the towel 
and just say, it's enough. You know, I've, I've tried to do everything that the Lord wants me to do, and all that we've faced is struggles and problems and violence and prison and all of these other things, and I'm done with it. But Joseph doesn't have that attitude. His attitude instead is, we've been commanded by the Lord to build up Zion, and we will do it. And I know we will do it. And that optimism and faith really comes forward, I think, in this volume. Joseph Smith Papers Documents, Volume 7, is available now. I'm Glenn Rawson, and thank you for joining us. Thank you.